And then could you link the video too? Yeah, I'm grabbing that right now. Oh yeah, I know. So, so uh, there's a certain point in a draft. Right now, right there. Screen share. There's like a certain point in draft that you're going to be able to see like what the champion's identity is, right? So like, if I'm in this draft and let's say whatever, I'm not gonna actually draft, but like in this draft, right? So I can tell you what happened. They first picked Renekton and Elise, uh, and we picked Ivor in first pick, right? Or something like that. Or even in your game, uh, where's your match history? I don't think I can see it. Uh, but maybe you can see customs. I remember it used to be able to. Okay, I can't. GG. Uh, can you? Let me look at your screen. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Can you pull up the? Or you know what? Send me a screenshot of the, of the select if you could. Thank you. And then I'll screen share. Do not turn on camera. <laughs> okay. So like even in a draft like this, you said they first picked the Kaisa, right? Now, Kaisa doesn't give away everything about a draft, but it certainly leans into a couple of things. And it leans into especially having a CC support and having some sort of a damage dealer in the jungle. That's what it kind of leans into. Or having oh having a damage dealer, uh having a damage dealer like support side by side with her and having a tank jungler. So okay. basically like Pike, Nautilus, something like that, and a carry jungler. Right. And it also leans towards A D jungle or mid being picked, right? But you don't need to know all of this stuff. Generally, all you need to know is like where is the champion strongest? Right? Because nobody's gonna draft a champion and then pick like weak champions with it, right? So you see this Kaisa first pick and the response of Zaya is completely fine. And then Jarvan is where it kinda gets muddy. And I'm not gonna like do a whole entire draft review for you guys. But this is picking dive into into Kaisa, which if they pick the proper tools to deal with this, he could perhaps get one shot this game. Obviously, he didn't. He went 6-0. Uh, but you need to also have, like, backing for him, right? So this Jarvan right here is essentially going to act as engage and not as a carry champion this game because yes. of the picks that happened. And you understand how I came to that conclusion, yeah? Yeah, like, we... that That's what, what was our conclusion, too. Like, Zaya's major carry this game. Mm hmm And just looking at always... Okay, well, compositionally, there's kind of like three things that you can have. You can have engage, util, and damage, right? And this is really, really simplified. So if you're, let's say your jungler is engage in utility and slight damage, right? He's kind of like a really flexible pick Jarvan, which is why he's good. Same thing with like Rakan in the bot lane. He provides a lot of stuff outside of damage. But if he provides that, then what do you want to specialize in as a... Uh, as a support then what does your composition need at that point like utility yeah you need utility and you need possibly damage yeah and then you look at what they're picking right so next they picked what hacker Mion, right yeah so they're committing full on to the dive so dive what's good versus dive of course counter engage right and at that point you don't have the support pick so i'm okay with you holding support pick because you don't see what they're doing but at that point, you could probably pick get away with picking something like Soraka, right? You could probably pick Soraka. You could probably pick uh, Karma's okay, but there's also Braum, Karma. All of these champions are okay because they provide like a shit ton of utility and shielding to your team. Like, what about right? Janna? What do you think about that? Uh, Rakan and Janna, these are kind of like, I'll list these kind of the same, and I'll get into it a little bit. The reason why Rakan and Janna aren't the best is because it's it's just not not a guarantee that your AD carry can lane if you pick Janna. But and it's not a guarantee that your AD carry can lane if you pick Rakan. I mean it's kind of guaranteed, but I'm assuming Rakan got banned. Yeah, he got banned in second rotation. So Janna, it's just she doesn't have the lane that other AD carries have. Right, I mean, other supports. So have. that's just like putting me a foot a foot back for no reason. Mm -hmm. And she has no innate synergy with like your team, right? So Jarvan, huge combo with Jarvan is Soraka, and I think people should be picking a lot more with because the J Cad J4 and R. the silence, right? Yeah, the silence, yeah, the silence. 
And then something like Brahm can give you Radiant Virtue, and it's like super, super valuable because the moment that you pop that, now all of your teammates are being healed and all of their dive is going to be kind of nothing. Same with Karma. The moment they engage, you have Mantra E. And your team doesn't need to engage onto them. All your team needs to do is wait for them to come there first, right? So that's another important thing to look at, right? So my role this game as a support champion is going to be util and mostly anti-dive, right? And you can establish that just by looking at the draft. And then on top of that, we need to be at objectives first. So having a champion that can clear out wards fast or having a champion with fast move speed, something like Bard, of course, does a better job at it than a champion like Zerath, right? Because he can run really fast. Karma as well does a better job than another mage. So basically, you were kind of locked into picking some sort of an enchanter here. Lulu also works, by the way. I forgot about Lulu. Lulu is also really strong. Yeah, it was a toss-up between picking Karma and Lulu on this draft. Mm -hmm. So that's good that you recognize that. And then, again, just because I have inf I play a lot of these champions, Kai'Sa, if you want to counter Kai'Sa, people are first picking it. All you need to do is pick some sort of healing and shielding, and she doesn't really function as a champion anymore. Because Kai'Sa is a champion if you look like... If you look at this champion, all of her damage is on this, her passive, right? Even when you're going full AP, it's all on her plasma, which is all based off of missing HP damage. Even when she's going AD, most of her damage is still on her passive, right? So if you keep the HP high with a champion like Soraka, with Braum, with uh, Ivor, and something like that, she can't really play the game. She won't ever do damage, basically, which is probably what you saw. She probably did, like, 2k damage this game or something, right? So that's always the first thing I want you to focus on as a support is always going to be composition, right? Because your laning phase, you can always look for ways to win laning phase. But like if you're down in composition, it's really, really hard for you to play, at least in competitive, right? So comp should always matter the most in competitive. And the second thing yeah. you look at, obviously, is your lane. So that's kind of the difference between you could probably go back and say, well, I could have probably picked Lulu here blind or Karma blind and given a counter pick to my top laner. Right, or to my mid. And you would have had a better champion than Scion here, because Scion is really useless into the enemy team. Yeah, like, the thing with, like, our top laner is that he, like, plays... Because he's, like, not our actually, like, official mm -hmm. top laner, so he's just a sub. And he doesn't play League, well, that well. He's, like, a jungler, yeah. so he doesn't... Yeah. So it's either, like, Scion, Nar, or Aatrox. Or, yeah, but you can yeah. understand how Nar would be a better pick here than, like, Scion. And he can't, like, you can blind Nar, but, like, blinding, picking Nar after you see the Ornn is so much more helpful, you know? So Th you're thinking that, I don't know, like, what would you have done? Because he was picking, like, um, he was picking fourth on red side. So, like, what would you say to pick, like, Nar anyways? Or, like, because I don't understand yeah, top, that, right? So that's, that's the point, right? Like, look at your comp. What did you guys need? Well, w what you needed was you needed more damage. Because if this champion somehow gets, these two champions get screwed over, you don't have enough damage to actually kill anybody on their team, right? Like if Hagram didn't int this game, having Zaya as your only form of damage versus him is really, really sad. So having a champion that just does some sort of damage versus the Hagram, whether it be like Gnar or whether it be even a split pusher or just whatever, it's better to save it for last. And I'm not saying you need to do this with this player. I'm just saying, ideally, right? Ideally, so, you should recognize right now in the meta, Karma or Soraka or Lulu is strong enough to just blind pick with this Zaya and just slam it on four, give your top laner counter pick, or okay. give your mid laner counter pick, either one. Okay. Like, you could have picked Gnar on, what do you call it? On, uh, you guys were red side, right? You could have picked Gnar on R3. Yeah, you could have picked Gnar on R3, banned out some of the hard lanes for him or whatever, and then you could have picked Karma, R4 or Soraka or whatever, and then and then R5 knew, would have been counter. Like, we knew that they were gonna play, like, some engaged bot, right? So it was either Leo mm -hmm. or not, so we banned the Leo, so they went not, so, like, you know... Yeah, not, like, not as Soraka, easy to deal with. Yeah. Like, Lulu, like, I guess it's fine, right? Like, I... Yeah, and you have Braum, too. I, I think... There's no point into banning into a pool that you already know how to beat. Uh, like, if you if you were going to commit bans to it, like, any bans to it, you should have picked the R4, if you get what I mean. So, 
ban like if, if you're if you're not banning it, then you can save it for R five. But if you're committing bans into it now, that's draft then resources. You might as well just ban it, right? Okay. Okay. Yeah, just ban it and then give your top lane your comment back. Unless okay. of course this has an OTP. But this is all ideal stuff that we're talking about. But it all leads yeah. into game but, structure. Like understanding, right? It's just building understanding, even though it's like post game. Yeah, and and the point is, what you want to do is from the start of draft, like like from the first ban to loading screen and even lane eventually lane and then whatever you want to have all of this like game planned out not in a linear way like how i drew a line but you want to have like an actual understanding of it right so imagine the start of draft would be here on a tree right and it goes like this 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 you already know the decision tree right yeah like, imagine it goes all the way and then lane starts or whatever this is the start of draft what you want to be able to do is create a picture of what you know works later in the game and then think about how you can achieve it through your picks and through the way that you play the game. So enemy team is dive. You can come to that very simple conclusion, right? Start with general questions and you go to specific answers. How are we going to counter the dive? Well, we're not going to just say anti-dive. We have to come up with champions and then we also need to consider at what point can we stop building compositional advantages and start focusing on lane advantages instead? Or at what point does it like transfer over? Like Zaya beats Kaisa in lane and she also does a great job at anti-dive, right? So just create that picture that you have later in the game, create the idea of how you want the game to be played. The win condition is the best word to say, right? The win condition that you guys are gonna have and then work backwards from there and be very, very specific about what you think wins you the game. And then these picks and the places that you're picking them will make more sense. Right? Mm -hmm. Because uh, you can start to work backwards logically rather than trying to get to an answer like out of nowhere. Imagine if you were like taking a hike and there's like five paths and you don't know which one leads where. Rather than if you walked back from the place that you were trying to get to initially and you know which paths lead where. So you can take whichever path you know will lead you there. You already know it, right? But mm -hmm. if you're trying initially to bridge that gap, you're not going to have any idea of where to go. So try to come up with every single time, and this is just an exercise. The first game, obviously, we went through it together. But always, whenever you have a game like this, out of draft, you should have a good idea of what you want to play towards. right? So what does Karma do this game? What is my role? What is our win condition as composition? And what do I do for it? Mm -hmm. Right? Because it'll explain your runes, it'll explain everything. So that I don't have to go in here and be like, okay, you're doing X, Y, Z. Like you could have done Emacs, you could have done that because it'll all click with you. We'll be like, okay, well, we wanted like a lane advantage. So I went three points Q, blah, 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 blah. Like that makes sense, right? So always get an understanding of where you want to be eventually into the game. And so did you recognize the whole entire idea of building an anti-dive composition? Was that something you recognized in this draft? Yeah, like, I mean, first pick Kaisa is kind of already telegraphed with that, right? So, yeah. and especially with um, literally everything they picked. So I understand that it was really important for me to build uh, Shrelios for move speed, because if they can't touch you, then how are they supposed to engage on you, right? So, um, mm -hmm. and then I know that... Uh, Zaya is going to be main carry, main DPS, so just build Ardent for her. and Like, just build whatever, like, Zaya needs, right? So, Yeah, whatever makes your team live. Like, let's say if they were hardcore focusing you for some reason, like Nautilus was pressing R on you, even building Zanyas on you would be completely fine. Because eventually, your Lissandra's going to have Zanyas. There's no point for them to R Zaya. Zaya's always going to R it, right? Just having that problem-solving in your head is really OP, right? But yeah. let's watch the game. You guys are Karma, Zaya, right? So yeah. I want you to talk through what lane advantages you guys want and what overall the lane win condition is, right? Uh, so I know that it's processing, so it's like... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm a, I think uh, this is better. So I know yeah. that I am... Um, it goes up to 1080p, but that's probably... It's Anyways, it's, it's all right. Uh, 
I know that I'm strong. Like we are strong uh, in like especially like early since it's uh, range versus melee, and like we just both have more uh, attack range than they do. And I know that on two, uh, if Nautilus ever hooks me, then we win the trade. But uh, the trade loses if he hooks Zaya, and maybe they will i don't know like maybe they win level one if they hook me or if they hook anyone what do you think so i mean level one probably no because you could just start mantra w if they hook on you uh and if they hook on zaya you could just hit the kaisa and obviously she could flash it and it could be dangerous but we're getting too specific what i want you to focus on is like in your experience how do these lanes go like, I at what hard win hard win and what are the only ways that you lose this lane in your experience? Hook Zaya. So free, yeah, early six. Or early damage, right? And like jungle ganks as well. To, and when you yeah, to me the way that I look at jungle ganks, right? Like I should never. Uh, it's it should be either one of two situations. It's uh, which is winning either way. So it should be. Uh, we should never be ganked, uh, surprised. We should never be surprised by a gank. It's either we would win the 2v3, or we have the wave set up in a situation where there there is no opportunity. That's the mm -hmm. way that I look at, well, uh, you know, bot, right? So That's that's good, right? So what do you need to win the 2v3? You need summoner uptime, right? So never, it's like the same time, every time I play Ezreal Karma or whatever, unless you are cashing in on something that you've done well, you should not be using your flash or not put yourself in a situation to use flash because the moment that you lose flash, you have to stop pushing in the wave because the enemy jungler could just sack all their camps and sit bot lane. And then your jungler has to do the same thing. You should only be putting yourself in the position of being ganked. Like you said, if you know you win it, all right? So hold your summoners, right? And bait them into fighting a 2v3 that's winning. In the meantime, since you guys have priority, your main focus should be hitting tower. And if your main focus is hitting tower, then what sort of a wave crash do you want to do? Uh, three or four? So you only do three wave crash. You only do three wave crash if you are going to be resetting or setting up a gank. Yes. That three is wave the crash situation. is really, yeah. I think three wave crash is really, really bad if it's in a lane like this. And I'll explain the reason why. So on a three wave crash, uh, sure. On a three wave crash, the second wave is going to be meeting. And if you guys did, you guys do a three wave crash in this lane. Uh, uh it kind of went haywire. Yeah, you did, but because we know because we wanted Jarvin to gank on uh early, like after yeah. his third camp. Yeah. So why do you want that though? Uh, because we want fed bot lane. Okay. Now you don't have to do like a direct gank because the only way they ever die to a gank here is if they're bad, right? But you guys actually did. Let's see. Uh, I baited. You didn't, yeah, you didn't do three wave crash, and the wave is here. Now I'm gonna go over two concepts. First of all, where is the best place for Karma to be in lane, and uh, where is the best place for Nautilus to be in lane? Not right now, but like in general. In general, if it's not against Nautilus, like by the bushes. But since it is Nautilus, like I played in the wave. Yeah, so just in the bottom lane, where is the easiest for you to hit Qs? Uh, depends on what side I am, right? If I'm on red side, I'll be hovering towards river. If I'm... Since I'm on red side, I'll, I would want to be by river. Mm -hmm. So you want to hit I'm them from the sides? From yeah. the top, yeah. Yeah, you want to hit them from the sides or from the bottom, yeah? And you see how this lane, it funnels in here, in these two spots. Right? Yes. So if let's say your wave is here, you can't really do anything to hit them with Qs consistently. But you notice how it immediately changes when you crash the wave, and now you can play here. Yes. Or you can play here. So those are the two places that you want wave to be. You want wave to be either straight in the middle, or you want wave to be here. The two places you want it to be. And if your jungler is ganking, you don't want the wave here, because the jungle gank isn't good, because they could just one shot your Jarvan. It's much, much better if you have a counter gank opportunity set up than an actual gank. Because when you have the wave here, you're going to generate two advantages. A CS advantage, a gold advantage on your support, and also an HP advantage. Right? 
Uh-huh. All of those give your Zaya easier time to carry. For example, uh, if... Let's just move the AD carry here, move support here, there, there. And let's say there's a wave at tower. And you're able to stand here and mantra Q, this guy, over uh -huh. the terrain, which Nautilus can't hook you through. Uh -huh. Now, where does he have to play the lane? Uh, if you're just barraging him from tower. here. Behind their tower. And what does that let your AD carry do now? Press Q. And get feathers, yeah? And yeah. he constantly takes poke. These two champions constantly take poke if they want to be able to actually get any minions. And then the general rule of thumb, and I want you to always remember this, is during melees, you can't reach the enemy, and you can't stop them from getting the melees, because it's very close they can send back here and get them. So during the melees, focus on getting plates. During the ranged minions, that's when you focus on poking them. And I could show you that even in my game uh, that I played Caitlyn here. So I want you to look at how I didn't even do a two wave, uh, three wave crash. I did a two wave crash and I let the wave meet here, which is a little bit bad. I should have crashed maybe a little bit faster. But you see, cannons up. I don't even try to hit them here. I just hit the plate. And then the moment that the melees die, I was so tilted by that, by the way. <laughs> the moment the melees die is where we start hitting them. You see? And it opens up a good opportunity here. It ends up getting a kill. And even later in the lane, I do the same exact thing. Sorry, this game kind of went haywire. So watch the melee, the cannon. I can't stop her from hitting them right here. Can't stop her from hitting cannon. I can just chunk her, like trade into her for cannon. Can't hit her on these melees. I'm just hitting plate. And then the moment the melees go down is where I start playing up. Because I can start zoning her off that minion. You see how far that minion is from her? Yeah. I poke her for it. And that sets up on a really nice dive. You see how every time she's going for a range minion, I'm walking up, wait for the Ivern Q, uh, R3 to get a Q through, and he flashes it. And then he ends up dying to Ivern. But you see how I eff effectively denied him way more than if I were to try to punish him by diving him or trying to hit on melees. Because during melees, I would have just uh, took tower aggro. He could play so far back. So that's what yeah. you want to do. That's my vision for this bot lane right here. And the vision for the bot lane comes from where I want you guys to be at. I want Karma to have a vision advantage because remember how I said you need to be objectives first and you need to be clearing vision. I want you to complete your support item very, very quickly this game. So getting that, how do you complete support item quickly? You get it through lane. So level one, you guys should really, really be starting in lane. And this is where kind of the VOD review is going to start of where I'm just going to go yeah, over your mistakes. It's like, it's because they didn't leash. Uh, I, I asked, right, if we should like like play up in lane and then like on level one and we were like um like unsure but i was like i want to see it like i pinged them like i want yeah. to be here so you're certain about you want to be pushing in the wave right you want wave control yes. so if you if you want wave control the two things you need to know are where is the jungler starting so that could be something you tell your team okay level one guys were karma jarvan Lissandra, Zaya, we're pretty strong. We're not like the strongest, but Karma's pretty, pretty strong. So let's focus on finding out where he's starting. Do you like, think we would have won just... an invade with this comp or no? No, you don't, but it's non-committal. Like, okay, so you just could, get vision. Could, just get vision, yeah. Like for right now, you could say, Cyan, hey, check their blue buff right, right now. Like what are the odds that they're going to kill him on blue buff with an orn, with an orn <laughs> and whoever the jungler was, I forgot. Like... Uh... Yeah. Hecarim. The Scion could literally go there and actually 1v2 them, if you want me to be honest, right? So, just having the presence of mind to tell your jungler, or tell your top laner, or tell your AD carry what they need to do. So, I want to do this because it leads to a bigger objective. This whole entire, like, decision tree that I've already mapped out. So, I need somebody to do this. And you see how that's more effective than, hey, we need to do this and then it's like, okay, well, what what are we going to do, right? You find that middle ground. You work backwards. So you say, we need to find out where the jungle's starting, right? So if jungle is starting top lane, you guys can't win in lane because I told you that, well, it's not that you can't win in lane, but trading early is kind of bad for you. So then becomes a question of, hey, maybe I'll let myself get hooked on purpose and start W and mantra W and we'll get a good trade onto Nautilus and then build that into an advantage. Well, I don't like that. I want to start Q and abuse Kaisa, right? So 
What I want to do instead is place a ward maybe in tribe rush and then play the lane organically, just meet at first wave and just be stronger, get the push, right? Don't get hooked, but get push. And you see how it starts here, right? You get hooked here. If there was a mantra W, sure, you win this really, really hard and he probably has to flash away, but you don't have your Q up anymore for the actual minions. So you need to just get the priority first because they're never going to win versus you guys. Uh, like at level two, they only win level one if you're isolated off wave. So just stand in the wave and hit the wave and cue them when they walk up. Like right now, you could be standing in a position more like right here and cue, be ready to cue the casters if they walk up or even cue the Nautilus because you're immortal when you're behind a minion in this lane or when you're in a minion. Wave. The moment that they're able, you see how you should have already been in that position to cue the Kaisa. And yeah. the damage looks good, but she would have never been able to walk up here anyways, if you if you were already up, right? Uh -huh. At this point, you guys are in a good spot. There's no way they're going to get level 2 first. The wave is really, really good. So what I would tell my Zaya to do is crash this wave, and I would tell my Jarvan to hover for a gank. So fast crash, and hover for gank. I don't know what you guys did. Zaya's pushing fast. Really good job. Good Q there. Push fast. Yep. You guys spam autos. Yeah, this guy's inting now. W is really, really late. It probably would have been better just to E the Zaya, but it's okay. It's kind of hindsight. If you would have dropped Ignite on him right there, maybe you could have had vision to W him right away. Because I didn't have, like, but... okay, yeah. Because I didn't yeah. have vision. It was like. It, it's probably just better to go E there. And right here, you crash this wave. Remember what I said? Hit the plate. What are you afraid of right now? jungle why you have mantra w and two potions what are you afraid of nothing yeah so you you understand how like when you have the gameplay set up game plan set up they're even both level one under tar right now like right now you should just be standing behind this minion or standing above here in fact you should definitely be standing here mm -hmm. and then what if the nautilus flashes mm -hmm. on your ad carry well hopefully you would have had e but it's okay like you're still gonna win it you're still gonna get a kill and a trade back I mean, if he flashes, she flashes, and he dies. Yeah, either way, it's it's a one for two. And then, because you guys conceded the prio, or rather conceded the, the advantage that you had here, you lost the advantage that you wanted to play, you didn't get half HP on this plate, you didn't deny Kai'Sa any minions, and now what you're setting up is a slow pushback into you, which doesn't benefit you, because all that it's making happen is making Kai'Sa behind Zaya. And this is like a huge thing about AD carries because all they ha all they have is ego, like it's tunnel vision. It's like, well, if I put the enemy AD carry behind, then I'll get ahead. But no, you're not. Because Kaisa is not scaling against Zaya this game. Kaisa and Zaya are scaling against the enemy front line. Mm -hmm. can, I, can I kill that person when we engage on them? Mm -hmm. So Kaisa doesn't care if you put her behind in lane, if she can get kills later on. And Zaya doesn't care if you... Like, if she builds an advantage on Kai'Sa, because she needs gold to be able to kill the enemy. And this puts them in a situation where, yeah, they could play for level 3 here and try to kill. But they're really bad, so they don't kill. I don't know what Kai'Sa did. I here. just baited. They were like, get hooked. I'm like, okay. Get hooked. It was, <laughs> yeah. it was, just know that you die here if they play properly. Yeah. Unless Zaya literally heals the second this hook hits, which she didn't, you die here. But... And then it would have been a one for two, but again, Jarvan got these kills. The Zai is not getting gold, right? And you didn't get plates, so you're not winning out here. So even though you guys got an advantage here, this isn't like, if it makes sense, the proper way to play it. Because it's still giving them counterplay. Plenty of counterplay. If Nautilus were to just go roam and leave lane right now and leave Kaisa just kind of fucked, wouldn't matter. She could get advantages others, like at uh, another point in the game, right? But instead, you guys held this freeze, and what are you doing right now? Now you're roaming against the Nautilus, you're kind of homeless, right? You're not getting any XP, you're not getting any gold. You only have 300 gold on your support item, when you should have more like 450 right now. So it's kind of like homeless, right? Never, never able to walk up and hit plate. So that's what I want you guys to focus on. Every single time I play with a Karma, let me see if I can find a VOD where I play actual Rift. Is there a way to sort these where I play Rift instead of <laughs> Airham? I've played too many Airhams game. <laughs> okay, this this game I played Ezreal, I guess. Okay, Ezreal Braum versus Ziggs. Okay, I inted here. 
I don't want to watch it. Never mind. I ended. Uh, -huh. <laughs> uh let me see if there's another game. It's cause like when uh I'm like hitting tower, I just like for some reason it just feels like kind of illegal for me to like be up that way. Why? Why is it illegal though? I don't. It just feels like that. Yeah. Why though? <laughs> there should be a reason why you feel a certain way. You know. I can't explain it. <laughs> it's like when I play mid too, and I'm like, oh, it's like I'm hitting tower, and I'm like, oh, it feels so bad. And also, if I could talk to your AD carry, I messed it up. But you should always auto the middle minion here if you're trying to build a push in, and then last push hit as late as possible. Yeah, to... to push in. I'll show you. I'll show you real quick. It takes two seconds. You hit the middle minion because it'll drag their minions into your wave. And then you build a really, really slow push that they're going to miss a whole bunch of CS from if you play past wave and they can't play the game. And it also clumps the enemy minions. So you don't need to drag minions? You know? No, no. I mean, well, for like level one, like, would you still like drag minions to like do that? Or would you just hit minions? No, I, I was, yeah, I was playing with Project J. It all depends on where you want the wave to be. There's a whole bunch of wave manipulation tactics, but the most important ones are the ones that you can apply into every game. Pulling a wave, you should not do every game. Right? Sure, you could argue that you can do it in games. Like, so what I do literally every time I play Ezreal Karma is I do this literally every single game is I'll ward this bush and I'll ask my Karma to stand here. All right? Uh, whatever. I'll ask my Karma to stand there and I'll stand here and I'll pull wave. And if they stay in, if they start in wave, uh, like she just comes down and gets a free, free Q poke right here. And if they don't, she's going to, they're going to walk through tri brush and I'm going to be able to pull the wave and they're going to miss like three minions XP because she's going to get Mantra Q on them. Mm -hmm. But most times you're laning against the karma and you're leashing, you're just trolling anyway, so. Mm -hmm. But I'll show you the... But I'll show people you the... will still leash anyway, so, like, what can I say? Yeah, even, even in Challenger they leash, so. Yes. It's like... And then also a really important thing that I can show you right now is, so you see that middle, middle minion, yeah? Just auto it. It didn't aggro on me there. Oh. But you see, yeah, okay. you just do that. And then if you tell your AD carry to do this, you see it accelerates the push that you have into them. You see how I'm up like three melees right now, and they're going to miss these three melees if I play up right now. And also, another thing that you can do is usually when you auto this champion, you draw minion aggro, right? But obviously, when you stand next to a bush, you can drop the aggro instantly. So you do something like this when you're playing Karma, and you can start like Sweeper, so the minions never hit you and they can never trade back. Obviously, this is bad on Caitlyn. In a lot of games, because you just want to get your headshot faster in the bush, but you know what I mean. Doing this is really, really good. And then obviously, I'll show you. Uh, I'll show you the plate thing too, since I'm in game right now. It was put really, really fast. <gasps> Gg. Okay. It's so like on Caitlyn, always people try to play up and stuff, right? But like on this, they could be standing and hitting the way from here. Maybe the cannon, they have to stand there. So I could put like traps maybe here or there or wherever. But the idea is they're tethered to how far their auto range is on minion, right? So at this point now, they need to step up into this pocket to hit the casters and I can walk in and out of tower range and hit them. Oh, whoops. I can walk pretty far into tower range and still hit them. GG. I'm going to. And you can even hit between tower shots and it'll hit them as well. But that's the idea, right? That's how I want you to play the lane. I want you to play hyper aggressively. But what happened in this lane, this game, is the enemy just inted and you kind of just let them in. Like right now, good W. Right? You guys should instantly turn. You should never like click back at all. And the one criticism I could make, obviously, it's kind of like hindsighty, but whenever you're with a Zaya, you like the enemy being in a line, right? So when you're kiting this Hecarim, you want to kite him towards the direction of your Zaya, at least like in this situation, right? Because if I you line them to avoid the Nautilus Q, yeah, so but I'm let's like say you're walking, 
like into my wave. Yeah, let's say you just mantra W though, and you heal and ignite the Akram. I think that's the best play that you could do. Like Q him right now, lead with a Q, because he's going to be clicking in, into you right now, right? And then go mantra mantra W and ignite him, and he's just dead. I think even if you get hit by hook, I think you live. Because you see how now Zaya has to space back so that she doesn't get hit by the hook. She can't click forward. So you're saying I tank the hook? Well, put yourself in a position to tank the hook. Because uh, this guy should be dead instantly, and you have heal and mantra W. So he even if you die, die that fast, though. You no, know, he, he he really does. He really does, and the only reason why is because you didn't Q beforehand. You would have gotten two Qs off in this fight if you would have Qed right now. Instead, you've held your Q for a very, very long time. Like, you held Mantra Q until now. Where he was already dead. But just do a base Q, and then do Mantra W, and he's dead right away, pretty much. And you can even kite upwards. If you're really, really afraid of getting one shot, you could just kite this direction instead, and he'll die instantly, too. Huh. They, they clicked into you for some reason, and then he autoed a ward for some reason. What are these scrims? No offense. It is like uh these aren't scrims, these are actually like matches. No way. Yeah. Oh my god, Zaya, no <laughs> He could have auto through Nautilus and kill them both. Don't tell me you flash mantra. No I don't I don't have an angle to cue there, so Yeah, but look at the wave. You don't need to do anything. She's gonna be losing a shit ton if you just wait a little bit. I think that's definitely what I've seen a lot. Like uh it's I think you're very focused on, if it makes sense, your play style is centered around not making mistakes as opposed to pushing advantages and understanding everything. Because the only time that you should be scared and the only time when you are scared as a person is when you don't know what's going to happen. But if you know what's going to happen, you wouldn't be scared of it. You kind of get what I mean? Yeah. So if you if you know what's going to happen, you already know what's good and what's bad for you and what's going to happen, then you would never be scared of walking up and hitting a tower. Like right here. Because what's the only situation that Hecarim comes bot lane is if he did a three camp and came bot, right? If he does three camp and comes bot lane, you have your Jarvan right here, you can call him for a hover right after he finishes his gromp, and he'll be the same time. Look, he, he did three camps as well, right? So Jarvan will make same time as Hecarim. So just but you're hit, not... and then since I have flash, if they go, then we kill them. Yeah, hit. But you need to know all this stuff to learn it. Like, if you walk up and if you do this in a game and then you die, you didn't do anything better. But because you see everything, all the context here, he did three camps. Hecarim has to do three camps as well. If he wants to kill you guys bot lane, or obviously he could do drugs instead. Right? He's gonna make same time as Hecarim does. And... You guys have two potions, have your mantra, have everything up, and have ignite and flash. You know all that stuff, right? So what's the fear? So the let's fear say is if this is like solo queue or something, right? Would this still be the correct play? Uh, every time. And it's the difference between like people playing the game properly and people playing the game to just kind of troll. Not troll, but like if if I did this in a game. If I did what I'm doing here in a game with like Tarzan or like uh, Blabber, he would flame the shit out of me. Because this is a huge mistake here. Maybe like 500, 600 gold of, of uh, value that we just lost. Because I know like I could be more aggressive, but it just like feels a little int. Well, get the idea of aggression out of your head. You're not being aggressive, you're just playing how you should play. If you know all these things that I'm saying, which obviously you missed something, right? Uh, like, I'm not saying that to flame you, but obviously you missed one of these things, then you would have done the play that made sense. Am I wrong? No. So what was the thing that you missed, and why? And that's what we gotta focus on. Um, my feelings. Yeah, you gotta overcome that, Don. You're anxious. Yeah. You need to stop being anxious about this sort of thing. Because the worst that happens is you go into bot of you and you say, hey, I should have played this differently. Or, like, for example, let's say you did this and your jungler didn't do a three camp and match it. And then you guys died bot lane. 
that information that you just gained is so much more valuable than whatever happened here. So it's just like... Well, you're never going to get better until you try doing what you think is optimal, even if it makes you feel uncomfortable. Because those are the moments you learn the most, is when you're uncomfortable. Okay. So, my vision for this game, I'll tell you what, how I did it, right? Obviously, I do this through the method that I talked about. Like, I, I know what's good, what's bad. Eventually, later in the game, I understand the win condition overall, right? And what we want to do is accelerate Zaya this game. So, that's that's something I just did right there in my head. Our win condition is having a fed Zaya because she's our only damage source and she's good into anti-dive. She'll do a really, really good job this game because of the way that she interacts with like Nautilus R, Kaisa, and even Yon, right? So Zaya will do a really, really good job this game. So we want to accelerate her because she's scaling against the enemy front line. These champions, right? Orn, Hecarim, Nautilus. And Kaisa scaling against whether or not she kills you two or Lissandra or Jarman. Right, so Kai's is scaling against something completely different of can we one shot when we engage? And it doesn't even matter how how behind the Kaisa is, if she gets to the point where she can one shot somebody on your team, their composition starts working then, right? So I got all that information just off of looking at draft. And I'm not saying that you want to do that, but you need to practice doing that sort of thing. So win, con win condition is to accelerate Zaya. We don't care about Kaisa. She will always get to the point that she one shot somebody. We want our composition to work, to start clicking, so that we can start playing our game, right? So accelerate Zaya. How do we accelerate Zaya? Well, we need to be able to force plays that give us gold. For example, tower plates give us gold. Uh, dragons give us give us an advantage, right? Rift gives us a huge advantage, right? Getting uh, kills gives us an advantage. Right, so these are all things you have to look at. What are the ways that you can generate gold and XP onto Zaya? Not against the Kaisa, but against everybody else in the game. Because if we're talking about building an advantage, it's much different than talking about building an accelerated AD carry, right? We need gold and XP at a faster rate than anybody on the map, not just Kaisa. So what we want to do here is if you need to be accelerated, one of the easiest ways to do it is play through economy, right? So, hitting every CS, right? CS is always important. Plates, Rift, Skirmishes are really, really, really good for her, if they're winning, of course. And there's one last thing. There's going to be, uh, uh, what do you call it? What was I thinking of? Oh, like item advantages and runes. So, like, Futures Market or Treasure Hunter, stuff like that. So, like, this is a great game if Kaisa goes Treasure Hunter. But, like, this game, I probably think she needs to go Ultimate Hunter. But, like, just as an example, right? Or having Futures Market or having free boots. It's all really, really good this game, right? Uh, biscuits would be okay this game because it lets you push your advantage further. And then you look at your support. Well, what... Our support needs to have items as well. We can get free gold from this through plates. So then I go from what is our win condition? And I have all of these things going on in my head. Right? What's our win condition? Accelerate. What are we going to do? We're going to push and take plates. What's the counterplay that they have to that? Engaging on us. So we want to put ourselves in a position where we win engages. Or we deny engages. I made two A's. And you see how that thought process starts from what is our win condition and it moves down. And I want you to be able to do that because what you'll start doing is the moments that you mess up and say, okay, well, we need to be accelerated this game. We need to push forward. We can go back and say, hey, where was our mistake here? Was it in our game plan or was it in our execution of the game plan? Uh... And this is. Yeah. This is where this is where you get better as a player. You don't get better as a player just by playing bot lane, spamming a thousand games, two thousand games. You start thinking about what is the game plan, what is the execution? Where was our mistake? Does one of these champions work in a way that we didn't understand and it changed the game? Like did Hecarim do a three camp and then gank us or gank us at level two and that never happened before in your life and you're like, What the hell? How did that happen? Well, I don't think any of I don't think our game plan is wrong. It makes sense to me. Doesn't it make sense to you? 
yeah, what we laid out? It's just like the only like the new thing that I didn't really think about before is because like I don't know what I don't know, right? So how I'm supposed to go figure out what I don't know? So mm -hmm. like that's why you get people to tell you the things that you don't know, right? So one of the things I didn't know is that like it's just a different perspective of what does it mean to build an advantage or to accelerate? It's the way that I've thought about it. it's like, oh, like, you know, I'll just like beat them like level two. Or I'll just be, I'll, I'll just win bot, but it's not like the case like that. No, and it's something that I learned only when I was playing 80 carry, like in GM and Challenger. It is what took me out of masters because I always had the ego to say, okay, I'm just going to pick for my lane. I'm just going to, Stop my lane, and if my team loses because of that, then they're just noobs. And then, like, I'll show you literally this game I just played. I hope you don't mind me going to my own games for examples, but in this game no, I played, I, when I played Caitlyn, and I had 6-0. and oh. I was 6-0 and oh coming out of laning phase this game, right? What was the thing that I focused on? It was drawing pressure bot lane. Because, sure, I'm fed, but that doesn't mean that we're going to win the game. Because if their top laner is fed, which he is super fed this game, and their jungler is fed, then there's nothing I can do, right? Because they're just going to one-shot me. I'm just the AD carry. I'm just one champion. And it's not that a specific thing. It's just a generalization, right? So when you're ahead, you always want to draw the pressure. So I draw a gank. I draw ganks because I constantly push in. You see, I get to this wave. I don't let it slow push into me. I don't care about the slow push into me. I start pushing it in. And I was going to push this wave in, but my Thresh is like autoing a ward for some reason. But 10 out of 10 times, if I was Masters, I would have just let the wave slow push in and been like, okay, that's good for us, guys. I'm freezing the wave. And then my top laner would have been getting dove. But because I push in here and I play up like this, their jungler comes bot lane. He would have never come bot lane if I let the wave slow push in. I can't believe that trap didn't hit, but whatever. And then what happens here? We waste time. It gets my jungler ahead. Gets my jungler ahead, puts their jungler behind, and it gets me gold. And then my wave doesn't matter because I'm always going to push it in. So I push in, always push. Draw the pressure. And this leads to the situation I was talking about before. I didn't care about getting this kill. I give it to my jungler. My jungler can carry this game with me. More gold on me doesn't matter, right? Instead of recalling here, up with the dragon. Always try to snowball your lead. And everybody's familiar with the concept of snowballing, but like, use it in the context of the best way to secure your lead and win a game isn't by getting more and more fed. It's by spreading your lead across your team in a way that doesn't give the enemy gold. Like, I'm not going to go into my bounty to get a kill, right? And, like, that's just, like, um, contrary to how the society Literally everybody, works. Yeah. I need to make sure I have a good way for my, for my mid laner when he goes bot lane, so I finish pushing out this wave. Notice I push, I kill the tower, finish pushing out the wave. So the next wave that comes in is going to be really, really good for Echo. I even let him take the mid wave. He TPs mid, takes the wave mid, and then he goes bot lane. So now he generated a two wave advantage on the Akali just from that. And you were already ahead and you know that they're just going to like dive on you on any given opportunity. Well, not only that, but if a team has one threat, it's very unplayable for me to play the game. If I'm the only champion that does anything. But if I give my teammates an advantage in some sense, like give them a shutdown where it's actually valuable, like if I had IE off of a shutdown, I wouldn't give it to somebody, but give them gold where it makes sense, right? Make the enemy see how I'm not, I'm not even focused on getting more fed. I'm focused on putting the enemy behind and getting my teammates fed. Every one of my decisions is that, like, that's my win condition. Can you repeat something, that? Something flipped in my head. I didn't care about accelerating anymore. What I cared about is putting the enemy team behind at this point because I already got as much gold as I'm going to need this game. After I get my IE, I'm always going to be a champion. It's putting the enemy behind and getting my teammates uh, an advantage as well now. Okay. Because, like I said, I already got all the gold I'm going to need. Think about gold like you can't get gold back. When somebody gets gold, you can't like take it back. So when somebody gets gold, accelerated in a sense, they're going to stay on that curve 1,000 gold ahead of you. There's nothing you can do to get that gold back, even if you kill them, right? Sure, if you kill them, it'll give you more gold, but you can't take away the gold they have, you know? Yeah, unless if they make a champion like that, so... Yeah, unless they make a champion like that. 
So notice how even now I'm just trading super aggressively. Sure, a kind of int. But I get my IE. Every play I make is about getting my teammates ahead. I'm go I'm pushing mid lane instantly going to sides. Pushing mid instantly going to sides every single time. Grouping for every objective. And you can see here, I don't know if I press tab like ever. I do press tab a bit, but I die here like a noob. So look at how fed the enemy top laner is. He's like seven and one, but he cannot do anything this game, even though this guy inted his lane and played like a pig because my jungler got super, super fed off of bot lane. This guy has 10 CS advantage, one level lead on Akali, right? And then throughout the game, I'm going to be helping. I just drew a penis on my screen, sorry. He didn't have to say that, but okay. Okay, so like even look here, look how I press R here because I know my R reveals her in shroud, and I have I have my echo in inside lane here. Okay, I need to BRB real quick. I'm getting a phone call. Sorry. Okay. Okay, I'm back. Sorry. Are you there? Yep, hello. Hello, hello. But yeah, I know it seems kind of ranty, and I'm kind of just talking a lot, but I want you to change yourself, or change the way that you think about the game, so that you don't have this anxiety when you play anymore. Because those moments where you're anxious, they're really, really hurting you. Dude, watch this. Wait, watch this. Look at Jamaican, what he does. He just takes a lantern from me, man. <laughs> GG. It's okay, that generates a lead for your team. <laughs> true, true. True, true, true. But, so that's how you win games. You don't win games by just getting an unreal advantage and then hoping the enemy gives up. So yeah, I think I went over it enough. What I wanted you guys to do is two-wave crash, because that's the way you do it. But I want you guys to start with the thought process of let's make a game plan to win the game, and let's not just rely on them making a mistake here. And by the yeah. way, of course you should, of course you should mantra W the Nautilus here, but it's okay. I mean she's sitting on my face, so Yeah, but you're not gonna get the second proc and maybe Ignite kills you if this guy hits his auto. Like Kai said literally dropped the auto here if you watch. Yeah, I see that. So yeah, you should have Mantra W the Nautilus. But the, the, those small things hardly matter. You can go over that stuff in the VOD review. Like, if it really matters that much, you'll eventually start to learn it. Yeah, it's because also that I haven't, like, played much, so... Mm -hmm. That's also a factor. Like, I just don't like playing the game so i just don't play the game and i'll just study instead well part of that might be because you feel anxious when you play it it was for me honestly like right now i'm not playing solo queue because i'm worried i'm gonna get shit on or something i'm gonna i'm at 800 lp every queue is 20 minutes and then i'm gonna queue up for 20 minutes to get into a game where i make a mistake and then my game is lost because of it it's like not fun you know but yeah. you need to conquer that. I mean, maybe that's the issue for you. Maybe it's not the issue. But, like, uh, if you care about getting better, then you really got to work on being a more consistent player. And the best way to be a more consistent player is just making every game a game plan. Like, looking at, let's see, so carry a bot. So it doesn't have to be carry but you can look at any, any, uh, like, any game. Literally any game. Uh, what do you call it? I, I hope they're like single bots, but they're not. So I'll just have to scroll through these. But you just go in, you look at the draft. You could say, this is an exercise I did when I was coaching a lot of amateur teams. So you look at the moment that he's picking a champion, right? And the information that he has accessible to him. And then you decide what champion you would have picked there, right? 
and if his pick makes sense and what he wants to do with it. So you see this, Emilio. Emilio Zeri, good combo. That makes sense. Decent combo. And it's into Aphilios. He could have picked Lulu here, but he chose to pick Emilio. So he's probably going to give the enemy Lulu or Yumi or whatever and see how it pans out. So you could probably say that he pro he thinks, Kyria likely thinks that Zeri Milio is going to be stronger than Zeri Lulu in this situation. You can come to that conclusion. Personally, I would have just picked Lulu. It would be simpler. And then you look at the draft. It's Aphilios and Yumi here. I see that. Yeah. Just write it. So Philly Yumi, and then you talk about, well, what's going to be important this game? I'm sure some games could be boring. Well, what's going to be important? It's double double uh, range bot lane. They're both going to go Seekers, right? So obviously playing well with Poke is going to be important. Always the case where you have people going Seekers because you could generate gold through hitting them when they can't hit you. And then these this 2v2 is super volatile mid and jungle, right? And then top lane, you just need to put your top laner in a good spot to have a good R. Right, so there's volatility here. Bot lane is pretty stable. So what you want to do, if there's volatility here, and bot lane's relatively stable, you want to see who gets priority. We want to get prio here because we want to help out these laners. And that hypothetically, if they come bot lane to gank, we need to be ready for the gank to you know cancel that out. So that's what we want to do. That's what I would focus on as Kyria this game. I would want to get prio and I want to draw pressure from the mid jungle so my mid jungle has an easier time playing this game does that make sense how i came to that conclusion yeah so that's what you want to do at the start of every game and this is the exercise i do i just watch the game then and i start looking at what they're doing okay they're pushing in early they started with vision on the enemy jungle they see the enemy jungle and they're just going to continue to push and generate like an advantage like that point that you're talking about where like you're thinking about how do i beat these people they can go into that mindset because now it's just isolation 2v2 all they need to be aware of is the Spell Thief's trading and plates, and that's all that matters. And you can even see, he chose not to go Spell Thief's in the lane because he doesn't want to trade into them, and he just wants to get gold from his item. Because he doesn't think Yumi can walk up and auto him, because he'll kick the ball into her, and she'll be demounted. Does that he make went, sense? Uh, relic this game. Yeah, that's, that's the point I was making. He doesn't think Yumi can auto this game. So he just goes Relic. He doesn't uh... want to auto for fact. Like he doesn't want to trade because if he walks up and trades, it gives them a way to win lane. Okay. I, I, you could argue one way or the other. I think it's fine. I think both are fine. Probably spell thieves would make more sense if he had a more active jungler. Lee Sin's active, but I mean like a jungler that would just sit bot lane for him. Yep. And you can see that this is what I was talking about before. All right, they get the priority, and then they they're the first to move. Even though Lee Sin dies here, if they wanted to move, they could have just ran. Right? It's what they want to do. They want to help the mid-jungle. Whatever. And when that play happens, you could say, okay, what went wrong? We wanted to be able to move to this play, and we weren't able to move. So what was the thing that went wrong here? And this is the stuff that you focus on in bot review. Right? And I'll tell you, there's actually something that they did wrong here. Can you come up with it? Right here. They made the mistake. They needed to just, like, back off? Play Fog. Go run into River. What are you gaining from being bot lane? Nothing. Yeah, so go River. And if they go River, that's something that you could talk about in front of you. Why didn't we go River here? Well, we need to focus on why we didn't go River and why we were starting to trade into them. And that's how you get better right there. It's not going to be like, oh, we should have queued there and queued there. It's more like, uh, what were we trying to accomplish and why did we do what we did and how we could, how can we do it better next time? Right. And obviously, solo queue games go out the window. But like, even looking at this game, if you're Emilio, you could find a place to improve from just off that. We should have ran River after we pushed in that wave because now their lane is actually really, really screwed. So the two improvements I would have said is run river and find a place to recall. Find a timer to recall. And that's enough for a VOD review. And you could say Kyria fucked up this game. Because of that. He's probably going to lose, if you want me to be honest.
Let's see. Oh, his team 1v9. Never mind. Malphite carry. GG. Who carried this? Let me look. But you could... Yeah, it's literally Malphite. <laughs> <laughs> He's level 15, bro. What the hell? But uh, you, you kind of understand what I'm getting at, right? It's an exercise you can do every game. Come up with something that you could be doing better. Or the overall game plan. Aphilio, Smilio versus Jinx or Khan. You want to win lane this game, and I just know that because of my experience. What would you say you need to do this lane as Aphilio, Smilio versus Jinx or Khan? Uh, use, use range advantage and then go gank the jungler. Jet plates, maybe, right? Poke the Jinx. She has no sustain, just Rakan Q. So then you could focus on two things. You could say, we're going to poke them, and we're going to avoid Rakan Q and get plates, and then, of course, worry about jungle. And then you can simplify lane into a couple of concepts. What's the best rune for me to get an advantage in lane as a Philios? Well, it's definitely Fleet, Celerity, right? Uh, that makes the most sense to go for poke, right? So everything makes sense. There's, like, a solid way to play this game. And then, what do you do level 1? Well, Rakan and Jinx are probably stronger than you level 1 if you give them range, so you just play max range. You see how he drags the wave in here, like I said? He looks for auto. Because when you draw, get the auto off here, and you're the one playing here, and Jinx is the one playing here, their minions will get dragged down, and you'll get pushed into them. So now what do you do? You spam auto the wave. And Emilio needs to spam auto the wave too. But he's not, because he's a piggy. Get the push. Because Milio didn't spam auto the wave, got hit by Rakan Q. Now they lose the priority. Jinx also used all of her rockets, which drains half her mana, right? So it's completely fine. She traded mana for HP, which is fine. But you see how he's just getting spam hit by Rakan Qs? It's like really, really bad. Because we talked about how that was such an important thing to avoid. Watch Rakan Q got hit again. It's just making the lane really, really unplayable now. Jinx used all of her mana to get a three wave crash. He freezes it. But this doesn't win anything because, again, our game plan is to push. So he builds it eventually into a push. And they're going to look to get a plate advantage here when, the, when this wave crashes. Well, they're not playing up at all. This is a mistake should instantly push in the wave. Notice how who he's focusing the damage on as well. And then they want to hit plates. But whatever. Right? You don't need to do it like how I'm doing it. I feel like I'm kind of wasting your time right now. But all you need to do is look through the games, try to come up with a game plan as to what you want to do, and then focus on what you should have done. That's all it takes. And looking through the VOD that you did, uh, the VOD that you sent, uh, I could probably see a couple more mistakes in the macro, in the light game, but, like, the game was a stomp, so I just wanted to talk about your laning for now. Yeah, that's... But you, you, you guys could have played this lane a lot, a lot better, and it would have given them a lot less counterplay, too, so... Let's see how the execution is on this dive. I don't know what your Zai is doing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just yeah, I don't know, but I uh, you know I played like absolute dog water. I'm looking at your support item, it's still not upgraded. It's so sad. It's 13 minutes into the game and you have no support item. Man, that sucks. That's 300 gold you're missing. It's not because like you get a huge build off, but like it gives you, first of all, Sherlock's legendary passive. It's a whole entire different item that makes you stronger as well. And then also it's 300 gold that you should have right now, that you don't. Yeah, it's okay. So, he should right, have just he... backed off. You I should have just your... ignited the Hecarim, like, right, instantaneously, right? Uh, yeah, and I don't think it's worth rooting this Orn. Because I didn't Unless... know Hecarim was coming, because I ran through his topside jungle. Yeah, yeah, at that point, it's fine. It's too hindsight to say that, but yeah, it's okay. 
And then also I'm literally you... in his jungle before it happened, right? So I'm mm -hmm. like, uh, surely, right? So. And look at how Uzziah is pinging for help. Right? If that's happening, just run mid. Like, screw this play. Push in the mid wave and then roam up top. Because right now, what Hecarim could do is just run mid lane and they could potentially kill Uzziah instead of coming to this dead play. I mean, to be fair, he does have, like, enough vision so that he shouldn't die to it, but you never know where he would come Yeah, from. like, in this situation, I said that I was going top, and I got, like, approval, I guess. Like, he said, oh, yeah, it's okay, I'll be fine. Like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, like, the habit of mantra queuing is, is completely fine. Just understand that if you are in threat of an engage and you don't have your mantra E... I like do want like, W. What right? do you mean? Is that what no, you're saying? No, when they're engaging. No, no, I'm saying you use Mantra Q a lot. Like, just to trade. Because I like know right that here. I'm so much, um, like, farther like, ahead it, than they are. So that's why I'm like, I am I can get away with this, right? So it, it's yeah, like... Yeah, I, I, it's, it's, that, that's exactly what it's about. Can I get away with it? And... Uh, just be careful that you're not using it. So, like, right there on that engage for half a second. I know it hardly looks like it matters, but, like, you don't have Mantra E if your team were to get engaged on. Just for that second. And sure, it's really hindsight E, but, like, you should always be focused on what is the way that they have back into the game at this point. Because you're so much gold ahead. Because who who cares if you get, like, a 200 damage chunk? You guys can't win, get a tower off a 200 damage chunk. Mantra E here. Yeah, there you go. And just be spamming that. And then I wish I could look at your rune page too. Do you know what runes you want? Yeah, I want Comet, Slurity, Scorch. Did you go Nimbus Cloak or Mana Flow? You uh, went Nimbus. Nimbus. Okay, yeah, good. You never take uh, yeah, yeah, I know, Mana I know. Flow. I'm just, I'm just making sure. <laughs> so yeah, it's like this game uh, that I watched. Do you think it would have been... Like, I took inspo second because I know that I want uptime on my summoner spells. Yeah. Is That's that good. like. That's good. And then I'll take this. I take, otherwise, I take um, domination. No, I think, I think what you did is fine. And remember what I talked about. You need to accelerate bot lane, right? What gives you acceleration bot lane? Free economy. What gives you free economy? Inspo does. And it also gives you summoner spells. Which is why every single game I play Kai'Sa, you could go look. Which I think one of the easiest ways to play Kai'Sa is to cheat economy and accelerate yourself. Like you really, really want to get fed on, on Kai'Sa in the majority of games. Because not every game do you have like four people engaging for you. But you'll see. What do I do every game? I have two things that cheat economy for me. This. This. Oh, three things, I guess. And that. I always go this, or I go futures or biscuits. I, I actually I never go biscuits. I always go these two, and both of these cheat your economy for you, so you can get further ahead just off items. And I always, always, always start long sword refillable. Always, no matter what. Why? Because it gets you your ship faster, and refillable is like really, really good economy. So I never have to worry about buying potions for the rest of the game. So like in terms of karma, I would take like cosmic, but then I'm just like. Biscuits are bad, so I don't buy oh, those. Biscuits are good. Why, why are biscuits bad? They're good. Because they're, like, not as effective as something else. What? What, then? What would like, they be worse? Uh, like, biscuits, right? It only gives you, like, so much. And I don't need the mana. I don't need the health. Like, sure, yeah, it's great to have. But I'm never in a situation where it's like, oh, I wish I had biscuits. Yeah, but you could understand how you might want biscuits if you're playing under the tower and poking the way I said that you probably should be in this lane. Because look at how much time you have between your abilities right here. You haven't casted your Q for well, probably 20 seconds. Of course, you can mana regen it. But if you keep them pushed under tower, you're going to be casting Q every 7 seconds. Like just the, the, the raw Q, not the mantra Q, right? Uh-huh. Because I it's easier try to it and see how it feels, but it's well, like... you don't need to go biscuits. It's it's just the idea of it helps you do what you wanted to do in this lane, and also it's good when they engage on you. You just pop a biscuit and it gives you nice value. 
obviously if you want to go futures market or whatever and whatever like you could do that if you want to go stopwatch stopwatch is completely fine as well like if you ever think that you're going to be diving them you could go stopwatch right so you might say okay what are the odds that we shit on this line so hard that nautilus just leaves the kaiso 1v2 a hundred percent yeah so you you could just go stopwatch then and then when she gets left to 1v2 you could just dive the kaisa yeah with mantra w stopwatch and you just kill her so you could always play for that or what are the odds that they're going to engage on you they're decently high right like you could live one time with a with a stopwatch and it might change the game stopwatch might be fine here too with insight but yeah i mean the three things i want you just to focus on is like okay so when you play a game it's even in my slideshow when you play a game, I want you to focus on where you want the game to be. What's your win con? And work back from there, first of all. It's like next time I see a VOD from you or next time that you just play the game, try to approach what you want to do this game and then work backwards. And then the other thing I want you to do is just soak up all the information that you possibly can. So try to find patterns. Because... The reason why I know the stuff I'm telling you isn't because, like, I played Jungle 50 games and I know how Jungle Clear exactly works. It's because I just pay attention. Well, this champion can do this, this champion can do that. Notice the strengths of each champion and where they're, where they're best. What's the role that they play? And start to notice the patterns and then take advantage of the ones that are good for you. And replicate these. because like the thing i told you this game how zaya needs to be accelerated does that have any carryover at all yes the the fact that zaya this game needs to be accelerated i mean like in another game that it might be the situ like the same situation but different yeah, the concept. Like, character yeah the concept, the concept of that... needing to accelerate may to carry yes yeah the accelerate part is something that you can carry over right but the idea that this game, this person needs to be accelerated, it doesn't teach you anything individually, right? Like, uh, not individually, without the context. I get, I get what you're trying to say. Yeah, yeah okay. So what, what I want you to focus on is be able to come to these conclusions yourself and not rely on, like, generalizations about champions to do it. Like, I don't want you to think every single time Kaisa plays into Zaya, Zaya needs to be accelerated and Kaisa doesn't care about how much gold she gets, you know? That's not what you should think about. We should yeah, think about no, what I wins this. Like, the bigger picture, mm -hmm. and, and like like context. Like here are the here are the rules and guidelines, and understand when to break them. That's what makes like good players great. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And always focus on a general question. Like even when you're talking in draft or fod review, everything always start with a general thing. So, uh, let's say this game as an example, and it didn't go like how it went. Just like a random game. You say, how do we win objective fights? That's a very general question, right? Well, how do you answer that? By being there first. Okay, you see how that's a general answer? Yes. Everybody should already know that. But how do we get there first? By having say, prio. We, how do we have prio? At what time should be resetting? Should, like, like, all of those things are the things that matter. So like, in a game like this, you can say, okay, Rift spawns at eight minutes. Rift is super important this game, yeah? Uh-huh. So we don't want Nautilus to roam to that Rift, and we don't want him to be impactful. What are the things that we can do to impact that Rift fight? Uh, dominate lane? Dominate lane, so this guy doesn't hit level 6, right? And you'll be level 6. What are some other things that are outside of your lane, even? Uh, jungle tracking? Jungle tracking. So when at eight minutes, these people are going to be six and these people are going to be six, right? Everybody's going to be six if the lane gets played normally. Maybe they'll be seven instead, jungle and mid, right? So if everybody's going to be six, everybody has ulties. And then there's another really long cooldown that's important. It's summoners, right? Flash. So just knowing that you at eight minutes, there's going to be a fight. What can we do to prepare for it, right? And looking at specific things like, okay, let's go mid and pop Yon R or Flash. Like, maybe two minutes before the Rift Herald spawns, or uh, not two minutes, maybe like a minute before Rift Herald spawns. Let's go do that, right? 
Or let's dominate bot lane so hard that Nautilus doesn't hit six by the time that Rift spawns. Or let's have a big, huge wave pushed in so that we can go roam to Rift Herald and Kaisa doesn't get anything on the other side of the map. You see how I'm getting to specific things? This yeah. is the way that you got to think about the game. Start with a big question and move into small things. How do we win fights? Well, what fights are we taking? Right? Focus on that. How do we get there first if we need to be there first? What are the important things? Obviously, cooldowns, right? Gold. Who, what champions need to be there? What champions can split push? What champions on their team don't like stop us from doing that? How can we stop them from doing from stopping us, right? Like it's all about counterplay. And what was good for one comp and what's good for another. So just keep this consideration. Those are the three things I want you to learn is just think backwards, right? So think backwards. Have a picture of how the game is. Start big and then move into small. Those two specifics. Oh. And then the third thing would just be noticing patterns and paying attention to information and playing around it. Those are the three things that would make you better and would make almost any other player better as well. But especially in your case, I'd say the most important thing would be I think you already do a good job of looking at the big picture of things, but just working into more specific things and understanding how to play around them with patterns. These are like the big things for you, I think. Yeah. So next time you send me a VOD, like I, I always think of a first coaching session, like I'm never going to tell you about specific things like mantraing a certain person or whatever, but I will tell you about like how you should have played the lane. Next time, I just want you to like explain your concepts in a way that you have logic behind everything that you do. Okay. So I want you to have a thought process behind every, no, you could say every click if you're being really cringe and weirdo about it or like Crucile or somebody else, but like. Yeah, that's like a little bit too much, but yeah. You could say every click if you want, but like every action that you do should have a thought behind it. It shouldn't be like, I feel this way. Try to put like logic behind what you're doing. And if there is a feeling, like, I want to do this, then find out the reason you feel that way and figure out if it's a good feeling or a bad feeling. Like the one that we're talking about here, hitting the tower here. Because so, it felt wrong. Yeah, so go back. You, you say, hey, at this point, it felt wrong. Right? And you can ask your team, hey, I don't know enough about the game right now. Or You don't say that because then everybody loses respect for you and shits on you. No, but you can say, like, can we walk up right here? In VOD review to your AD carry. And then everybody is going to give their piece on it. Like, what information? Well, the jungler can't be here. Well, if you guys want to walk up on this wave, when I'm Lissandra, I'll get Pryo on wave two and put a ward on Raptors, and I'll be able to tell you if you can walk up. And you understand how that makes you better then, and it, become, it, it becomes like a team thing. Anytime you have a feeling, judging what you're doing, rather than logic, just find out the root of it. Why are you feeling that way? Is it a good feeling? Is it a bad feeling? What can we do about it? Okay. Uh, and yeah, it's just like really simple, right? Because if we or even do Rift Kit, if I were to go back to Rift Kit and talk about this, right? What you could simply do is do a really, really simple play that everybody else does, uh, like when they have Caitlyn or something like that, which is the Rotate jungler. Will, AD carry? Well, jungler will start here, right? Do three camps. They'll do three camps and then come bot lane, maybe even invade. And then mid lane, what they'll do is because you guys have Pyro mid with Lissandra, they'll crash wave two. And they'll put a ward in the tri brush. And then that effectively blocks off any chance of you guys getting ganked. So what does it do? It lets you walk up and free hit the tower. And get folk. And this is like a super easy set play that, uh, I mean, it's not super easy, but like, it, I mean, it is. Because I feel like the difference between LCS teams doing this and amateur teams is a huge difference between the two teams, right? So, like, you won't even see this in amateur, but like, People in LCK, LPL, LCS, LEC, they all do this and it's really, really simple. So it's not hard to learn. But just communicating and saying, okay, can we hit this, can we hit this wave right now? Like I feel like we shouldn't, but like, can we hit it in VOD review? And then your mid laner will say, Hey, I can give you vision here if you want. And then your AD care is like, Yeah, yeah, I think so too. You can definitely hit this wave. And then your jungle can be like, Okay, if I skip this camp, I can help you guys out. And that's really, really nice. That's something that you guys should be trying to emulate.
I've been talking about this one set play for a really long time. No, that's I good. Been... That uh, we went through everything. Oh my god! Join the beta. <laughs> no. And and yeah, that's the reason why I, I really necessarily don't like coaching an amateur because people really aren't willing to try these things I'm talking about. Yeah, they'll just. I, that's Play understandable. Like, you know, like I coach too, but there's only so much that I know, right? Because I know, like, uh, <laughs> somebody might like disagree, but I know that I'm like humble enough to know that I probably only know like two percent of the game. I no no, you know way more than two percent. I think it's just uh, I think it's just the case where everybody in NA. When you think that you have something figured out, it's not the right way to think about the game. So as opposed to people trying the game and every single game kind of updating their encyclopedia or how they understand the game works, they'll have all of their beliefs about the fundamentals set in stone already. When fundamentals are the thing that people mess up the most out of anything, right? So if 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 you just understand that some of the things that you're doing fundamentally in your game might be wrong or might be bad or might like just stop generalizing. Okay. This is always good. Or I froze. This is always good. Or this wave is really, really bad. Yeah, or blah, blah. I like, like understand your is, that. Your like, is kind of goofing right there, but maybe you should. <laughs> yeah, maybe I know. Cause I told him it. in comms, I'm like, this wave comes back because the number of casters isn't enough yeah. to hold it right there. Um, is just, what I said. Yeah. Um, Did, that's why I backed right there and didn't help her shove, right? You could also just do something where you run under a tower, die, and pull the wave. But like, uh, I'm not gonna tell you to do that. <laughs> but <laughs> you're going on. A, you're talking about something before. What were you talking about? Uh, I was saying how I understand that the game is not the Bible, and what other people say, and what my own ideas are, are not the Ten Commandments, and that. If I understand, like, the guidelines and the rules of the game, then that means I get to break them. I have to, like, know them to be able to break them, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Yeah, it makes sense. And, like, situations like this, even, you can understand that. So, when they're pushing into us, it's, like, really bad. Because if they would have hit this hook onto Kai's, into Zaya, she would have been one shot right here. And him playing up is, like, really grief. And Zaya? Because he doesn't Zaya, need yeah. to be up here because the minion, there's nothing to hit. And if he says, well, the idea is I'm going to bait and and uh, bait the Nautilus to hook into but me and then bait, I'm going to dive it. But the Nautilus, if Nautilus, hit, that's the only way to lose, right? Which is like not hit yeah, hook like, on Zaya, but not hit hooks on me, then that's winning. Well, it's not just that. It's like if his idea is to bait this hook and it's like, okay, I baited this guy, go in. It's like, well, why are you playing for a bait? Like that's. 30% chance or maybe 50 or whatever percent chance of working when you can just push in the wave in two seconds when your karma gets slain and then you could play under tower the entire game. Uh, I because, think it also comes from the assumption that they're bad, so... Yeah, and that's kind of what I'm getting at because now it's not even a good wave state. Like, you're not getting an advantage. You're you're not getting as much gold as you should. Like, what is this going on right now? Their jungler comes bot lane one time and you guys are screwed, but... I don't know. <laughs> They're bad. They're really bad. So They're really bad. Like... Really, really bad. But I, yeah. even though this was like one of those quality games, there's I still found that there was a lot to learn in IKS, you know? <laughs> yeah. But, still like I said. Things. Anyways, yeah. Like I said, like, uh, like I can always go back and micromanage how you should have played this, right? Like, of course, you should be queuing this guy instantly when he shows, right? And igniting him instantly. And then, like, holding your mantra to see if you need to mantra W or not. Like, if he charges on you, then you W. Uh, mantra W, if he charges on Desai, you just normal W. Like, you don't use your W right now. You just auto attack and Q. Maybe you can even mantra Q. I don't know how much uh, how much your autos reduce your mantra at this point. It doesn't. It, it, oh, it doesn't? No. You need to be uh, 6? No, it, they've reworked her. So, it. well, it's I, only 5 I, seconds on I, abilities. Hold on. Hold on a second. I literally had a game where I played Karma and I got my. Unless if they 
re undid her rework that I was. Oh, you, you, you know what it is? Okay, okay, you know what it was? I thought my auto reset it, but it was actually my W that was giving me because the two procs of W it counts twice, right? See, the first watch? initial one. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, 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 watch yeah. This yeah, yeah okay, it. yeah. Yeah. So yeah, okay, okay. I know how karma works now. Sorry. I was griefing. So yeah. <laughs> Uh yeah, you don't you don't mantra queue there then. But the idea is if you can mantra Q and then W and then the two procs and then your next Q give you their mantra back, then you could probably do it. But like I would just normal Q there. Yeah. Just normal Q and ignite him and obviously I can micromanage this, but like it does it's not uh it's just like if you learn the bigger picture, then the smaller picture falls into place. So Yeah, because this play wasn't like planned by you, so it's like if 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 this happened at like level three, you could go and say, okay, I should have played it like this because I planned on this. But if the jungler just like Freddy Fazbear appears out of mid lane, I, know I mean, we I don't win know. like a three v two, so I wasn't super concerned. Yeah, and then, but like you want to control when that three v two happens. You know what I mean? Like this is just random jump scare coming out of river. Yeah. And then enemy just plays as possibly the worst way they could have. I, I think probably they could have waited on Nautilus to have his flashback up and killed you guys next time. But because he did this, like for oh my god, dude! Like uh, if if Hecarim just waited to be in flash range, Desire probably would have just died. Like it's just so much ego, and it's not the proper way to play the game. Don't don't get and I, I don't mean to flame your AD carry, but don't get the impression that what he's doing is like good at all. This is really really int. When you could Even just he, wait. Well, it's not when you could just wait, when you could play the game better in a more sensical way. There's no logic behind what he's doing, it's just ego. Yeah. Like he just do dodges oh I dodged the Nautilus Q I'm Smurf for <laughs> Oh shit, fuck. He flashed and I didn't keep track of flash cooldown because I'm just fist fighting bot lane perma. <laughs> Oh no, fuck. <laughs> and it's like, if you just paid attention to the things that mattered in the game, then you wouldn't have this issue. But because you kind of are playing the game like just to stomp, it's 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 like this weird concept, you know? Because the moment that the game loses structure is the moment that like you can stop understanding what's going to happen next. Uh, the best way I could put it is when you get on that trail you're on a hike and you get on a trail that you've never been on you don't know where it leads right you might say okay well this is going north and where i want to be is north from here but you don't know if that trail is just going to shoot off and go like that you know it could just do that obviously it wouldn't make sense but that's why a general idea of where you want to go is good but it's it helps much more if you just start at where you want to be point point a right and then you talk about how actually we get to point a from the starting point and then you work backwards and it's okay. like okay well i could do this and that and do this and that and yeah, whatever you know what i mean i know what you mean it's like you know what i mean right it's like so. i know what you mean <laughs> and then like right here of course just going back to what i was talking about always 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 play up here instead because if they're playing in this pocket it lets your zaya hit them and then, of course, don't hit her while she's going for melees. Like, this is so grief that you throw your Q like this, when you can just wait one second, auto the tower for your Spell Thief's proc, and then walk up and Q her. Yeah. But, yeah, it's okay. Those simple mistakes still get better as time goes by. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Do you have any questions? I really just ranted for a really long time during no, this session. It, it it was good. Oh, what the heck. Oh my I, God. I'm just here chilling, bro. Oh. So what are you hoping to do with this Kalita thing? Uh, I don't... <laughs> Alright, I'll, I'll, cut, I'll cut the recording right here.